Welcome. Welcome to CNET's Next Big Thing presentation, our marquee super session. I'm Molly Wood. And I'm Brian Cooley, and we're glad to have you joining us here on what is actually our 10th anniversary of the Next Big Thing. So how about a hand for all of you who've been with us for so many of those years? That's Staying smart hand on our part. here at CES. Very cool. Very cool. Glad to have you here for all that. Um, we are here, of course, to explore a topic once again that is going to be, we think, very much the future of technology. That's what the next big thing is all about. It's about going forward in something that's not totally futurist, right. but also not obvious. Although we have a futurist. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's right. We have a futurist. So a something. little yeah. bit. Yes. yes. So we'll be going in that direction as well. And uh, it's kind of a digital reunion of sorts is part of what we're talking about, uh, this idea of a post-mobile future. That's right. Hot, mobile devices obviously have been hot uh, at CES and beyond, and they, their usage has changed this industry dramatically, but we are looking ahead, as Brian said, into the post-mobile future. What happens yeah. when, we start to, when we get to stop, finally, talking about tablets and smartphones and talk about a connected world? Now, I know a lot of you are probably just gasp, saying, okay, we're still getting our heads wrapped around tablets and phones to some degree, especially with our consumers and customers. But the idea here is to stop having these silos of phones, our phones and tablets, and then computers, and then maybe connected TV or just televisions, another bucket, trying to get to a wall-to-wall -wall series of basically screens that let us get to whatever experience we want, whenever and however, and have a little more interconnection between those services. That's a little more difficult challenge, actually. And it's not too much of a surprise, as you might imagine. The CES so far has been all about this idea of the connected future. Yeah. Uh, we would also like to invite you to take part in this, of course, through our social media. We're doing that with Twitter, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you should be able to see our hashtag shortly posted on the screen. There we are. CNET NBT right there. Please tweet us during the session. Uh, and if you tweet mean things about our moderation, we'll never know. <laughs> so, yeah. go crazy. Um, I also want to let you know, if you're standing in the back, there is overflow seating in the room mm -hmm. directly next to this one. That one tends to fill up, too. So, if your feet are hurting. Oh, that's full, I just heard. Full, okay. Okay, well, if your we'll feet are hurting, back. I'm really sorry. <laughs> right. They're going to keep on hurting. Next Tweet time. about it. Next time, better shoes. <laughs> All right, let's dive in with that, then, and explore the post-mobile future. Last year, we officially moved into the post-PC world. But are we getting close to a post-mobile world, too? The next big thing in tech is always on, always connected, and completely programmable. So what does that mean for consumer electronics and the services that power them? Well, that's what we're here to find out today. I'm going to actually use the SmartThings app. Let's actually turn on the Christmas lights from here. As you can see, this is so much more than just like a remote control ball. This is a robotic gaming system. How long was I asleep? I must have been tired. <laughs> Do you want to listen to a story? Yes, please. Basically, it's a thermostat, but redesigned totally to be connected to the internet. According to Cisco, one trillion devices will be connected to the internet in 2013. Just one billion of those will be the mobile devices we're used to today. And in the future, our array of connected devices will, in theory, let us live lives that are much more convenient and much more personalized. We can connect the real world and the internet, and you walk into a retail shop and they know what sizes you have, they know what you like, they know what not to show you, you will have a better shopping experience. Not everyone is convinced that every device needs to be connected, though, or that all those connections are coming anytime soon. I think we're farther away than people think. I mean, there are more smart devices on the planet today than there are humans. But having them all connect together and work on my behalf, you know, people talk about, hey, I want my stuff everywhere. The refrigerator, that's a different story. You know, I might have to work with the home automation people in terms of how that connects in. I think we're closer than we've ever been. I think it's a journey, and I think we're partway down that journey, and it'll continue to go forward. So it's not next year all of a sudden magic. Connecting the world in a seamless, easy, and personal way won't be easy. It involves a lot of companies working together, radical new device and interface designs, and there will be serious privacy and security hurdles. But the future is already here. Figuring out what it looks like is our job today. So that's the post-mobile future. Yes. 
There will be several phases to our event today. We're going to have mm -hmm. sort of a three-part discussion. We'll look at how devices will change, how their connections mm -hmm. have to evolve, and then what entirely new categories are going to emerge. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. That's the good stuff. As we look toward really getting one more step further out. Now, to help us discover all those phases, we work our way through them. We've assembled what honestly may be our most interesting, diverse panel for this event. And let's bring our panel up now so you can meet them. Starting with tech entrepreneur and chairman of Access TV, you know him. Welcome, Mark Cuban. You don't mind going all the way to the end. From LG, also a company that needs no introduction here at CES, head of marketing and go to marketing and go to market operations. Please welcome James Fischler. Welcome. Next up, a woman with an outstanding title, the futurist for Ford, yes. Cheryl Connolly. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Good to have you here. Welcome. And finally, Sprint Senior Vice President of Product Development and Operations, Farid Adib. Thank you. All right, let's settle in for a good deep dive on this topic. Uh, to kick us off, panelists. Oh, these are good, comfortable chairs. Well, mine is. I don't know about yours. I know. Look at you, Diva. I want each of you to give us your thoughts, kind of a little lightning round here, of what you thought about this topic was the most interesting. As we worked with you over the last few weeks, bring you in here, get your minds working with ours on it. What about it most captured your imagination? Mark, start with you. I mean, the next big thing to me is about personalized medicine. You know, it's, we're just at the infancy of it, but just little things like in sports where we're, we're slowly able to put heart rate monitors on the players while they perform and nutrate, hydrate them and give them nutrition in response to what's going on in their bodies. We're able to prick their fingers and get some blood and analyze it and figure out what nutrients they need and help support them there. So I think personalized medicine to me is a big game changer and that, you know, your body becomes part of the network of networks. Ah, yeah. Not at all where I expected you to go, to be honest. I mean, that's really a very interesting angle on it. Well, thank you. you yeah. So you expected me to be dumb. No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be that way. Let me just it's going to be that way. We're just getting started. <laughs> James, your turn. I'm, I'm afraid Impress to go Impress us. Now. Um, I, I, for me, I watched that video, and so much of that is already here on the floor. Um, and it's not all futuristic. A lot of the future is, is already here. Uh, here at the show, we announced appliances that have voice control from your smartphone when you're not home. Start your washer um, remotely. Uh, you know, use your robotic vacuum and have it start cleaning your house again before you get home. Um, take content and throw it from your smartphone right to your TV wireless, wirelessly. So a lot of that technology is already here. I think it's an evolution, and I don't think we're there at the end, um, but I think we're a lot further along than we have been in the last 10 years. Cheryl, the futurist at Ford, you come at this from really a very different sort of a point of view because a lot of people still don't think of cars as consumer electronics, yet here you are. What's your take on this topic? So as a futurist, I'll, I'll just remind people that I cannot predict the future. Right. Um, but what we do look as, as big picture trends, social, technological, economic, environmental, political. And so when I watch that video, I, don't, I think most people in the audience would say they see more. They see more connections, uh, more information, more on demand, and I actually see less. I think that all of this hyper-connectivity means that we are going to get less information, less bombard bombarded with data. We'll get exactly what we need, where we need it, and when we need it. And I think that's really what the driver is, is that it's not about information. It's about getting the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. And then, Fareed, how about you? The most interesting sort of component of this, especially as somebody who is, in many cases, you know, hoping to provide the connection that could power all of this. Yeah, I actually have a little bit of a different point of view. I want people to have more connections. That means I can sell them more things. But <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, but I think Shocker. that, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, look, mobile technology is probably the most pervasive technology that's ever existed in the history of man. Um, you know, it's arguable, but I think you would say that, you know, we got six billion people in the world and more people have mobile phones than have running water and electricity, believe it or not. I don't exactly understand how that works because I'm not sure how you charge your phone if you don't have electricity. It's the Gilligan's Island thing, you got the bamboo bike. Yeah, exactly. Runs a generator. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think the one thing, um, you know, that's, you know, in our industry because we're in it and a, a lot of people here are just now getting exposed to how mobile technology influences their industries is that, you know, there has been this you know, concept for the last few years called machine to machine. 
It's not necessarily about people being connected to devices, but it's about machines talking to other machines and using the cloud to, to you know, serve different types of functions that you know, ubiquitously they don't have the capability to do today. And so I think that's the big thing that I'm excited about. And you see a lot of that technology here at the show, whether it's TVs that are connected or cars that are connected or, to Mark's point, health monitors and uh, e-health and things of that nature. I think that's the exciting part is that the pervasiveness of the technology, we haven't even thought of all the ways that we can use mobile wireless today. The problem is, though, there's some bad things that go along with it. And you know, uh, some downsides are that there's a limit to the amount of capacity and you know problems that you know could exist from Spectrum all these devices yeah. exactly yeah. Yes. we're definitely going to talk about that a little more first though machine to machine is a good jumping off point for our first sort of discussion topic which is obviously the most tangible and most relevant in some ways to the consumer electronics show that's the devices So far, the post-PC revolution has revolved around phones and tablets. But in the future, who knows what devices will communicate with each other and what those devices will look like. Increasingly, we won't just have one, two, three, four screens around us. We'll actually have 10, 20, 30, 40 things that we have around us, on us, smaller things, lighter things, closer to the body that also have sensors. But they won't be the full purpose, multi-purpose. They won't do 100 things. They'll do a few things really, really well. We're device agnostic. So we you know the moment everything's mobile, mobile, because frankly, they're cool and very easy to work with. But in the future, you'll be talking to TV. Or, you know, we might even get the internet fridge, maybe. Um, but ev everything that's on the internet, everything that's connected via IP, can technically be used through systems. Everything from the devices in your pocket to your home appliances, to your car, to the scale in your bathroom. This scale can work both in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So this is uh, my uh, white curve for the last uh, three years. Uh, oh. and, and you see there is uh, a periodic variation during summer and the winter. Holidays. Yep, that's <laughs> <laughs> December. First post PC and now post mobile. Let's imagine the possibilities of the connected devices of the future. So hardware. Here we are at CES and it feels like the consumer electronics world has gotten a little boring. All we've been talking about is tablets and smartphones. And yet, this year's CES, it feels like there are many more device categories. I was thrilled to see LG finally bring like, the washing machine out of the closet and up onto stage. <laughs> and the refrigerators. You know, talk, talk a little bit, maybe we'll start with you, James, actually. To talk a little bit about device design and, and what hardware, since you guys are in so many businesses, could start to look like. Yeah, I, I think we're changing, changing landscape, no doubt about it. Um, LG's designs are always driven by consumer demand. Um, we really try to look at everything through the lens of the consumer. Our motto is, life's good. Um, we want to make customers' lives better. And all of the product that we have here at the show is about that. Um, we have a technology called Turbo Wash, um, which is incredible technology, um, but it's about saving time. It saves 20 minutes on every laundry cycle. Um, you combine that We've with... We've never discussed laundry at the next big thing. <laughs> First time for moment. anything. I love and it. I already yeah. don't know how to use it. <laughs> but, I want one of the fridges. But imagine if that same washer can send you a message and remind you on your smartphone to turn over your laundry, right? A, a common challenge that everybody has. Or you're at the grocery store, and today this product is in market, you can check the contents of your refrigerator. Um, your refrigerator can make recommendations on recipes. You can set up profiles for members of your family that may have an allergy or, or, or be diabetic. Um, then take those same recipes and send them to your oven, right, through Wi-Fi, and have your oven uh, preheat. Um, and again, the, the entire network. You can do that via touch. You can do that via voice. Um, all of that technology is, is here today. Mark, do you get excited about connected appliances, or is there some other device you wish was here at the show now? I mean, I don't get excited about appliances at all. <laughs> we got to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm yeah. starting to, though. I really am. It's happening LG quickly. is just phenomenal. Right here, it's happening. It's Life is good, be right? Like a Life is good. <laughs> you know, the way I look at it, with consumer-driven devices, whether it's appliances or others, it's price first, functionality, and price first. And so all these things that we're seeing that we're starting to come down, it's because certain um, CPUs, whatever, hit certain price points, RAMs hit you know certain price points, and so now you're able to enable them. You're able to enable them with intelligence. But when you, look, when you try to look forward, if you take out the cost constraints to just say, okay, where's all this stuff going? We're still going, you know, CPU performance is still going to accelerate. It's still going to get smaller. It's still going to get a lot more interesting. So, you know, 
all this enabling, I think, is actually simple. The hard part is hitting costs. Where I think it's going is that as CPUs continue to get faster and faster and faster, we'll, we'll network ourselves. So we'll have in our wallet somewhere a CPU that communicates with whatever else, our sensors or whatever else we need to, to gather for information and whatever type of output we need. You know, Google's doing a thing with glasses. You know, you could have something in your pocket, your wallet, your purse that is your, you know, um, your, your central processor that communicates with everything, communicate with external devices. So I think the, the real concept is how small, how fast can you get processors and how, how efficient can you make communications in your own little network and then let those communicate outside. That's what we're going to see in eight to ten years so that we're not mm. constrained by what the, the physical devices are. Cheryl, it looks like you agree. I agree. I, I'm completely on board with Mark, what Mark is saying, because I don't think the hardware is the interesting part. I think it's the user interface that really matters. I mean, when you think about CES, this is my first CES visit, and I was taken aback by the range of categories that are here. It's, it's not just the mobile devices. It is things like LG. Automotive, Ford's been here for seven years. I mean, we've fundamentally changed the way that we go to market, because we think about the cars not just being a uh, vehicle for transportation, but something that enables a lifestyle of constant connectivity. And when you move into that space, that means that not only will your competitors in the landscape change, but the categories in which you compete against change. I mean, Google is making a car. Who would have thought? Um, but in this, this environment of constant connectivity, I think it ultimately comes down to um, not innovating just because you can, but what's in it for the consumer? Is it convenient? Is it accessible? Is it intuitive? As I listen to, I want a vacuum that cleans my house before I get home. And I need a washer that doesn't remind me to flip the dryer, just dries it after it's washed it, you know? You can have marks so, so I, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> there was a gift for each of you. Mark doesn't need his, so it looks like you're going to get two. Change, yeah, this, bridge, bridge, bridge. this is interesting because it kind of brings up the concept of shouldn't we solve simple tasks and needs first? I think that's what you're getting at, Mark, with the fact that it can be cheap enough to do so. I think some of the early uh, connected appliance visions, James, going back five or six years, were very grandiose. The refrigerator is going to know what's in the fridge, know how to order it, go to Safeway.com, get the order going, have the recipe pulled up based on what you've got tonight. Whoa. Now you're talking about a dryer that simply says the dryer's done. Go get the clothes while they no, wrinkle. No, you want to preempt all those things. You don't want to solve them. You want to preempt them. Right? So that, that's, I think, a problem a lot of companies get into. They say, this is what we've been doing. Yeah. Let's solve that problem in the, the simplest way, the least expensive, the most efficient, the best design possible. They're in their own view. Yeah, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, uh -huh. right? I'd rather say, okay, what kind of clothes don't need washed? You know, you, yeah. What, what? How do you preempt that problem so that you don't have to spend the time doing those things? You know that, and I think again, as we get more power, every, we, you know, every year we think this is the most powerful it's going to be. But you look at phones; they're single tasking. You know, now you're starting to see a multitask, and that limits, that changes how we interface with everything because you can only do one thing at once, basically. This brings up well, what Esther Dice, sorry. Well, if we do start thinking about what we need to do, what we don't need to do, that <coughs> seems to raise a, a relevant, or at least a salient point for you, Fareed, which is what devices don't need to be connected, right? I mean, as the guy who's dealing with the constraints, do you ever look around and think maybe all these devices don't need to be online? Yeah, maybe I your mean, water bottle doesn't actually have to be tweeted? Yeah, you know, we get, I mean, we get approached every day by manufacturers that want to use our distribution and our reach to our 56 million customers to you know, put devices in our stores, and sometimes we just have to question what really is in alignment with the wireless strategy versus well, things that are we use one of your devices. We use um, Sprint. I have a company um, called um, Motion Loft, and what Motion Loft does, um, it's got a little sensor. We put it on the outside of a building, so you can, let's say there's a big um, commercial building in New York City, and they have space to lease down on the bottom floor, and it counts just counts. Everything that goes by sends it over this, the Sprint network back to a central point and so we can watch the number of people that are in any one place where there's sensors in real time. And now we're starting to add additional sensors. So they can test for carbon dioxide, they can test for moisture, they can mm. test for any number of different things all in real time. And so you start looking at devices, it's not even the device that matters. The sensor is almost irrelevant. It's that information, it's almost, we call it Google Analytics for the, the real world. 
Just but, as many nodes as possible. Yeah, as many as you can get. We're putting them on bridges so that um, the transit authorities will know if there's, you know, this is a busy interset, interchange right now and it's snowing or whatever and you need to get here first because there's a lot of people there. Or here all of a sudden there's a congregation in this one part of town in San Francisco where there shouldn't be a congregation. Mm -hmm. Let's just make people aware of it, you know, for who knows what's going on. And this is describing a vision of low cost devices yeah. as you're saying barely even devices and yeah, low and bit it, rate bandwidth not putting a lot of load on your spectrum right so things that are easy to get into to really build up that incredible exponential effect now. of the data and we're doing this now yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think I, I think mark's got a point there's there's something about accessibility to data that i think primarily drives a lot of these applications but i do think there's a lot of things that you start to question you know uh, you don't tr start to question the innovation that's taking place, but you start to question what's the direct kind of return on investment. And I think that the one big thing that we're seeing from most mobile devices, and the phone, because it's most people's primary mechanism, um, what we're seeing is the evolution of what's happened to the phone. I mean, you know, when you look at it, when we were in 1G, 2G world, you know, when data throughput was really, you know, kind of light and it was slow, you know, it, it really kind of stopped a lot of the, you know, real applications from, you know, being invented and being pervasive and being yeah. out in the marketplace. What you're seeing with, with the speeds now being at parity with desktop speeds and what people are, are seeing in, in their homes is that um, the combination of that with all of the different sensors that are within your phone. For example, your phone has an accelerometer, it has a camera, it can sense motion. It knows everything about you because it's with you pretty much all times of day. Mm -hmm. That information is collected and I think that information becomes valuable for healthcare. It becomes ha uh, valuable for uh, applications like gaming. It, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can utilize that data for that you couldn't in the past. And I think it's the combination of the sensors, the software, the ability of the high-speed networks to transmit that information. And I think that there's, there's also kind of this idea, this personal area network that for a long time was a vision. It was originally one of the reasons Bluetooth was uh, right. you know, invented, but it never really came together. I mean, it's, for a long time, Bluetooth was only used for Bluetooth headsets. Well, now we're actually seeing people are using that phone as their central processing unit, and it's connecting to things like, you know, Jawbone Jambox speaker phones, you know, and uh, um, Nike Fuel Bands, and all kinds of things yeah, that are gathering and, and, information. Um, toothbrushes connected to kids' eye, eye touches, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, to make sure you brushed your teeth and to track it and get rewards for it and gamify it. Yeah, we saw so much Bluetooth in the fitness and health. We were really impressed by all the fitness yeah. devices that have come out as a major category at this show using networking from Bluetooth to Wi-Fi to 3G right. cellular. And it does, it sort of gets to the point that, the, that the, uh, uh, the head of design from Nokia was making in the video that you saw earlier, which is that, that these devices now, it, is it possible that they do too much? That what we really need is the information and then a very simple kind of terminal device that basically just accesses all that information? I was surprised by his comments because it does seem like that the, the single purpose device is, is really rendering obsolete. You know, if you look around the room, you won't see many people wearing watches because watches are single a single function. And so there, there are still those, I mean, you know, aesthetically, fashion. it's fashion. Totally old, it's, still, it's still fashion, but in terms of utility, you'll be hard pressed to find a person under 30 who wears a watch because they tell the time through their phone. And, unless it's connected to some other device. Yeah, unless, right. but right. Nike yeah. Fuel Band yeah. is a good then, example right, of it. Yeah. You know, but something that, so they, I think these devices, we want to carry fewer and fewer of them. You know, we want, we don't, we don't have the space to carry like all of these devices together. So well, those that can converge it into something simple and easy and accessible. Well, what's ones. really happening is all these devices are getting their own APIs, which are, they're becoming platforms for other things. Like, like with cars, it's, it's always amazed me, you know, I can have a GPS and I can have a map but I don't really have a programming interface so I could write apps because I spend so much time I can customize my car to fit me. Yeah. And Which Ford just opened up, what, yesterday? Well, you started to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. But just, program. Yeah. just on the DVDs that you use to load the maps, mm -hmm. right? right? There should be a programming interface to let me put, okay, here's Uncle Susie's, uh, Aunt Susie's house, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Joey's. It could be Uncle Susie's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... Um, but all these opportunities because you spend so much time in the car. But I think an API, as we get these devices, the, the first step is here's the device, here's what it does. Can we create a platform out of this device? Once you make it a platform, then all the brain power of everybody in the community that uses it can make it smarter and better and take it in directions you never imagined. Okay. Now, all these devices we're talking about, some real, some imagined, or some conglomerations of real uh, that need to come together more, none of them really get very far unless they've got 
the kind of connectivity that's going to support them in a really transparent way. So we're not really thinking about the connectivity very much. It has to be easy, pervasive, and affordable wireless connections throughout these kinds of categories. Let's take a look at some of that. A world of devices and services that offer a truly seamless digital life for the first time won't get very far if their wireless bandwidth and connectivity don't progress as well. It was only about a decade ago that investors were questioning wireless carriers' sanity as they spent billions of dollars to build out broadband for mobile devices. After all, wasn't calling and texting good enough? No one questions that anymore. Now, wireless, especially 3G and 4G cellular, fuels smartphones, tablets, connected cars, connected TVs, and new classes of devices, from the personal to the industrial. But there are bottlenecks ahead. A lot of that comes down to spectrum, the radio frequency space in the air all around us. It's kind of like gold. We sort of know how much there is, and we can't just go make more. This is why you see so many major telecom deals, successful and attempted. A flood of new users, each using more and hungrier devices, means data plan caps could become a real problem, not just theoretical. Overage charges could make this new world seem less worry-free, and the specter of metered usage instead of flat rate creating a perception of much higher cost. We can only maximize the connected future if we have ample, simple, affordable connectivity. How big are the problems, and how do we solve them? Help us, Fareed. You're our only hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's right. Middle. There's a lot of this on is on you, baby. You're our only this hope on stage. This is where I get picked on. Right? <laughs> a little, like a little no. bit. So, I mean, you know, it, it's definitely, it, look, you know, um, the one thing we don't have the ability to do is change the laws of physics. And unfortunately, you know, the... Uh, Google's working on that. Yeah, Google's probably working on it. You're probably right. Uh, but they, um, you know, I think that, you know, the, the radio frequencies and the spectrum that exists in the United States, the way it it works today is it's auctioned out and it's licensed to providers like Sprint and others in, in the country. And I think what happens is that, you know, you get um, congestion and in, in that, that kind of thing, but like highway lanes, there's a certain amount of highway lanes, and once you have a lot of vehicles on those highway lanes, they start to get congested. And that's what you see in the call world. When you were making calls, you'd see drop calls or mm -hmm. you'd see the ability not to be able to call this cell tower. Well, the same thing happens with data. Uh, you know, when, when you don't have access to those lanes, you are, have no ability to transmit data or you're, you slow down the speed of the data on, on those large pipes. And so the only way to solve that is either to allow us to use more spectrum, uh, which is hard to reallocate just based on the fact that you know, there's a lot of different people on the spectrum map. And if you were to look at it, it's a gobbledygook of different players from the U.S. government to TV broadcasters to yeah. you know, wireless carriage. And so it's not as easy as just kind of saying, let's just you know, open it up. But, um, I think it's, it's, it requires a few things. One is it requires um, application developers to get smarter about the applications and how they react to situations when the networks are congested so they can adapt. Uh, you know, t today, really, you know, most developers don't think about the mobile de environment. The ones that are being su successful in their user experiences, they've optimized their experiences to, to kind of work in those congested environments or work in environments where they use very little data right. uh, when they need to. And I think that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is we just continue to build out capacity, and I think one, one concept in our industry that's kind of catching on is this thing called small cells, where today, you know, we go out and build these big networks. Well, in the future, what we're going to actually see is that you're going to be able to buy these little uh, routers, uh, think of them as little small cell sites that you're going to just be able to connect and your home and your businesses, and they... It's a femto cells. They're femto house, cells, right? yeah, and, and there's more industrial versions of them uh, that you can kind of put on sides of buildings. And okay, these are not for customer premise. Yes, these are things you deploy. Some of them we would deploy. Right. And, the, and the reason we can't continue to deploy big networks is they start to interfere with each other when we have too many of them in a given area, and they actually create the negative effect of actually causing more problems than solving them. And so when you have small cells, they don't tend to uh, have as much power out in output, and so they don't tend to interfere in large areas, but they do tend to uh, you know, relieve the congestion because they're using backhaul like you know, cable and DSL, yeah. uh, where our big cell sites require these big copper and fiber uh, drops to them, which is very inefficient. So these small cell technology, we think millions of these around the country, 
uh, will help uh, relieve a lot of this congestion. But onto itself, there's no silver bullet solution. It's going to require a lot of show of hands. How many of you are carrying a 4G LTE device at this point in history? Wow. Well, here we are at CES. Um, this is a big number. It's uh, obviously is a very high penetration compared to the general population. But what of this this uh, theory that I guess is the best way to put it that we can refarm 3G more quickly than any of the previous whatever you call those segments of spectrum, that we can basically start to shut it down and move that spectrum to LTE faster because it can do it all. Is that, is LTE more of a do it all, uh, what, coding environment and, and RF environment that we can actually congeal everything on it and get more efficiency and more pipeline? Well, it's definitely happening. I mean, LTE has become the global standard. I mean, everybody, every carrier is going to LTE, but it won't solve the problem because even when you refarm the 3G spectrum to 4G, what we're finding is when you go from 3G usage to 4G usage, People's use it, usage quadruples in data. <laughs> so what happens is they go from where they were using maybe 100 megabytes a month or 200 megabytes a month, they go to using about 1.6 gigabytes a month on that same device. It's because get the device, to a cap there. you know, you, you, you get more data usage because you have faster speeds and you want to use it more, right? And so I think all it does is it increases the problem. It doesn't necessarily solve it. James, you guys so, juggle a lot of radios yeah. in your products. Yeah. What is your take on this? We, we do. Um, I think, again, customers drive the demand, right? So uh, they demanded more data faster, so 4G uh, evolved. Um, but is it a national problem or a regional problem, right? So certainly wa walking the floor here, hard to get a 4G signal. Mm -hmm. But you go to many other markets, not concentrated cities, and it's not the same problem everywhere. So, you know, I think the FCC is doing some good work in condensing, you know, open spectrum on broadcast and, and moving it over to 4G. But it, I don't know, maybe controversial to say, but is it really that big of a problem everywhere or in isolated places? Yeah, I don't think it, it, it's, it's starting to become a problem today across the board. I think everybody will admit to that. I think that it's the, it, when you look at the Cisco information on the amount of devices accessing the network and the amount of usage, it's going to be a, it's one of these problems if we don't start solving now, in four to five years from now, it becomes a very chaotic situation. Are there new technologies coming to re-enable bandwidth on, on wireless? Yeah. So we'll get another quantum leap in the amount available? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's, there's compression type technologies right. and, uh, you know, well, again, just, re, just reusage. There's right? reusage right. and, and refarming, but um, it's a very complicated problem because it's not any one thing that can solve it. And we've looked at everything and every carrier is deploying multiple different types of solutions to try to solve the problem. But it's the, it, what scares us is the billions of devices that you start talking about that start using the network. And you know, there's other things you can do like the personal area network where the devices share a connection and they intelligently kind of use the phone as backhaul back to the network. That's good. Well, and the That's reason I have the question stuff. is, you know, at what point do you cut the cord? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well I think it, because it does feel like 4G is the thing to get us away from bandwidth caps yeah. and wired, wired. I mean, I would love to have two devices on a wired connection and everything yeah. else. I'll, on well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say you cut example. the cord in terms of you don't have wired broadband. Yeah. Right. I'll, right. I'll give you an example. Yeah, exactly. One percent of our Just users that. generate 33 percent of our traffic. Mm -hmm. So there's one percent. <laughs> that, but there's like a lot of people here, and yeah. we're all doing that. Yeah. I think so it's you're in the one percent, which is okay. But there's there's ten, It tends to be not the general public, like you said, in, in populations, because you kind of see this kind of curve that takes place. Is that it's not that everybody is using all the data all the time. It's just that you sometimes also have people who abuse the networks, right? You know, they're using them as you know. Uh, they're streaming, you know, oh, hell yeah. access, oh, TV, access TV oh, yeah, to all their mean, friends. I, always, right? I got I my sleep box you. in the worst place. Yeah, you're the worst customer, Mark. <laughs> but most money. It's data that we pay. I mean, I, I always take issue with that. I, I was happy that you didn't say data hog, yeah. but is it really abuse for us to use the data that is available, to use the no. connection that's available in the data? No, I think it, And if we're the 1% now, yeah. we're the future 99%, yeah. right? I think we, we have a belief that, you know, we're the, un, the only unlimited carrier, really, you know, mm -hmm. truly unlimited carrier in the, in the country. And so we still believe that when you pay us for that unlimited usage, you get to use it unlimited. But we want to also make sure that, you know, we educate customers on, you know, if you're using it and you're using 100 gigabytes a month, you know, you know we need to probably have a discussion. Probably talk. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would, Dad! <laughs> I would add to this conversation, though, is that it seems to me that we're discussing it in a vacuum or a bubble. I mean, because, you know, we're talking about the evolution of, of the spectrum and 3G, 4G, LTE. 
this is moving so rapidly and when you pair it with a durable good like a car or an appliance you might render other parts of your your life obsolete I mean I was just at the hotel and I was trying to get someone to print something off and they said oh this is from we have outdated software this came from an, uh, you know another an older mm -hmm. a newer version there's a disconnect and I think consumers they're hungry for speed but when it starts to touch when this evolution of innovation moves so rapidly and renders other parts of the life that are constants um, inconvenient you have you have um, attention that's there and you wrote some confidence in technology in general I think those days are gone the, the whole you know 1980s thing the too where, fast innovation leaves people well, behind yeah, or you know the 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 guys who are afraid of technology and da 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 the, the, you know the, the those guys are, are you have met my mother I have think, you I know I would say <laughs> I think it's gone. possible that those days are gone in terms of adoption of technology I think though it is true that networking specifically is still way too hard to me that is the one part well, yeah, of the equation no that, you know, that I mean works. I look at all of your connected devices right. and I think mm -hmm. for God's sake like my router freaks out if I add a TiVo to it you know it's so yeah, that was, part of it is still so study dicey. There's a lot study that said 75% of people don't know how to turn on Wi-Fi and use it on their phone. Right. I mean, so imagine know, them trying to turn listen, on a refrigerator. Not, we are not most of rough. the general public. Most of them don't know how to do basic things like set up Bluetooth, set up Wi-Fi on their phones. This is not that our customers are stupid. It's just that the technology, to the point earlier, it's so complicated sometimes, and there's so much functionality in these phones, people just don't know how to use it. We haven't, we haven't simplified the process enough. And so how much worse does that get when you start to add in a car and then a refrigerator and then whatever else Mark's working on? So it changes you. I mean, you have to have an open source. You have an open architecture so that Ford builds our system so that we can upgrade them and, and pass out, you know, deliver free software to our customers so we can update as new technology hits the marketplace. But um, we're also concerned about feature fatigue. You know, people are very concerned about how they spend their money. And if you, I buy something based on its features, but actually get it home and realize that I don't access most of them, I somehow feel like I've wasted some of my investment, that it wasn't good money spent. And so the features are intriguing, but if they don't make my life easier, if they're not accessible, if they're not intuitive, then I feel a bit duped on the consumer side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were talking about it earlier. Um, a lot of features, I think, aren't explained properly. I think not all customers ex understand all features before they buy them. You look at the TV industry um, back in the 90s, PIP, people would, would not buy a TV if it didn't have two-tuner PIP and less than 5% of the people ever used it, right? So yeah. sold a feature that really had no, no usage model. Um, so I think some of the ownership is on manufacturers to make sure we're putting features in the market that consumers do get value at and do make their life better. But go, going back to the spectrum, I don't think it has to get more complicated, especially in the home. I think as more and more devices come on online at home, manufacturers across different brands, categories, and industries have to work closer together. We're working with Cisco right now on some of their prioritization work of your home network, right? Because not all your connected devices need to be on pulling the data at the same time. So do you set up a priority of when different right, devices you're work? Point, though. You're making the point. The fact that you have to have prioritized networking, which is going to, that means if it screws up, someone's going to have to come in and, and put in the admin login, right, and go to the router and reset your priorities because you just updated the software in your washing machine. You know, and it, it goes to another point. Molly and I go back and forth all the time. If we can't even get our wireless networks to work, how's all this over-the-top stuff going to impact TV, right? You I've been waiting you, for this to come up. Yeah, I had to. You know, <laughs> you, you just don't. You know, if you can't get your wireless network to work, we and we have talked about that at the show. That there have been there are so many solutions mm -hmm. for content delivery. There are new boxes announced here. It seems like every half hour, and it still is very, it still is very hard. It still is really confusing. But isn't that and the opportunity is... for entrepreneurs for, or, or for manufacturers to make it simpler, right? So like you said earlier, yeah. right? Forget about solving the problem today. Yeah, let's, problem. Let's, make it, let's make it simpler from the beginning. So I, I, I disagree and say that you know, we, can, we can solve it, and well, it's an opportunity, right? And we can do it together, right? And maybe it's an app. Maybe. It's almost, it's actually as if you read our minds, because that is our oh, next yes. topic of discussion, innovation and what comes next. We've talked about today, the immediate future, but the discussion really gets interesting when you start looking ahead to machine-human interfaces, to our personal networks, to the innovations that come next and sort of blow apart the categories that we're working with today. It's been called the post-mobile world, the internet of things, and the connected future. Either way, the trend toward ubiquitously connected devices could shake up the consumer electronics world like nothing else before it.
Right now, you can use a smartphone or a tablet to control the temperature in your house, call a taxi that already knows your location, video chat with anyone anywhere, lock or unlock your door, start your car, augment reality, or access nearly all the world's information in seconds. So what comes next? And in reality, all of you are cyborgs because you're not Terminator and you're not Robocop. You don't have to have a brain implant to be a cyborg. All you need to do is have a symbiotic interaction between you as a human and a machine. Once you've connected your home, your car, and your devices, all that's left will be to connect yourself. So the Muse is a four-sensor brainwave headband. It's actually able to sense your brain activity and give you feedback so that you can play games directly with your mind as well as improve your mental abilities. In the far future, this is going to be a tool that allows you to do things like control the lighting in your home or your automated phone system or your car directly with your mind. So the long-term future is actually allowing us to interact with devices in the world in really smart ways that are able to support you because they know something about you. When you say like the far our future. Do you mean far, far? Because we're already in an exciting future. We are already in the future. I love it. I love it. But what else does the future hold? Whether it's wearable tech, smart home or car automation, or machine-human interfaces, what will a connected future look like, and what are the opportunities for innovation? Okay, sandbox time. What do you want to see we don't have right now? Cheryl? <laughs> hmm. I want to see things that, are, that simplify, streamline, that give me back my time. I actually kind of intrigued in a backdrop of this constant connectivity about a retreat from technology, you know, finding a sanctuary, detoxing, um, real personal engagement. There seems to be a foot a lot of discussion about authenticity and craftsmanship, and I think that's in response to a lot of high tech that's in the world. Um, but it's at odds because we do want constant connectivity. It does make our life easier. It allows us to be more spontaneous, control our environment, influence those around us. So I think those things are are here to stay, and I think that what we have seen in recent years will look like a turtle's pace compared to what we're about to embark on. So can I read into that comment that you feel over the last few years, as you and most of us have been adopting smartphones and tablets increasingly, you feel like you're spending more time playing with tech, and I'm not using playing pejoratively, mm -hmm. uh, and that maybe the value equation is still TBD in your mind? I, I think that the value equation is there, but I think that we will reach a tipping point where people will try to, you know, I, I think the great irony of these digital devices is that they were sold to us on the premise that they were going to save us time, mm -hmm. but they, they steal time because we're constantly connected. We don't have downtime. We don't disengage. I mean, I don't even consider myself that high in the index of tech attic, but I still check my phone before I go to bed, first thing I do when I wake up, and if I should awake in the middle of the night, I'm so still glancing at it. Of, okay, what's on my voicemail? You know, that yeah. is a lot. It is, and it's you know, more convenient, it like you said, anticipating do the problems. I don't do meetings. I don't do phone calls. You email me, period, end of story. Unless you're going to write me a check, then I'll meet with you. <laughs> and call. Then we're going to be at Pete's, and Mark will be there. And I, I get so much more done, and I can go to my phone right now. I was talking to somebody yesterday about a deal I had looked at in 2002. Pulled out my phone. Mm -hmm. I had put it up through IMAP into Gmail, right? Did a little search. Oh, yeah, this was the email from 2002. It took me two seconds. It wasn't like, go look it up, go find it, you know, or ignore it. I mean, my life has been dramatically simplified because it's just right there. I can go wherever. I was just in the Cayman Islands with my kids. Fortunately, it's the hedge fund capital of the world, so the connectivity is good. So I'm, I'm in the boonies of the Caymans on the, on the beach playing with my kids. I can take a call no, you know, or take an email rather no one knows where, where I'm at and don't, doesn't care. But you are the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. I mean, your experience <laughs> I'm happy is... about that. And, and that's, you know, bravo for you. That's some good political positioning uh, there. Uh, isn't but I actually think that, that in the future, luxury will be afforded to those who can afford to disconnect, who can shut off the phone, who have an infrastructure, a system in place, a safety net that says, I don't need to check my email. I don't need to know yeah, what's calling me. Don't you think, don't you think people me. said the same thing about cars? They said the same thing about anything that took you from one, one world to another. You know, I, one of my favorite lines is, you don't live in the world you were born into. You know, just things evolve, and we evolve with them. 
And we are, you're always going to look at the, the changes you're going through right in that moment and say, can I live without them? Yeah, I think there's some social responsibility, though. I, I agree with both points of view, but I think there is some social responsibility that comes with some of the technology. And we don't tend to think about it, but things like, I'll use a basic example everybody can relate to, distracted driving. Mm -hmm. I mean, distracted driving is a place where I can't say that being productive in my car is a positive thing right. because you see all the time how accidents happen from this. And it's actually, it's becoming an epidemic amongst teens. And we, we as a company, as well as some of the other carriers, have realized that there's some responsibility we have to educate people on that because it's not just something that, you know, you know, the mobile technology, you can talk about the great aspects of it. You can look at, you know, there's some responsibility I think we all have where that's a bad use case of something we don't want to have happen. And I think to, to Cheryl's point, there are some pieces of that that I think also, you know, we, we see uh, enterprises where their employees are so connected that they're actually having to tell them to unconnect at times because they're feeling this kind of ongoing pressure. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us. Yeah. But, you know, it, 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 there, there's some... There's some Psychological and physiological type aspects. To the How stuff long that before have to we work. see the yes, text don't kill people, people kill people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, tomorrow. That's coming. Yeah. Does it does it argue though? Back to that point that it seemed like we were about to get into earlier. Does it argue for devices that do less? Is it possible that the devices themselves do too much? That if the data collection is more seamless, that if the information mm. flow is more constant, that if if a device is more simple, more simply a terminal into information, that maybe it's less of a distraction. I, my point when I said at the beginning is that I think in the future I see less, I see less distraction, I see less noise, I see less clutter. I think that the future that you're laying out means that um, I have curated content that's relevant to me, that resonates with me now. And I think that's the future. I think right now we're in a space where we're inundated with information. We have no ability to determine what's accurate, credible, or reliable. And that is a challenge. I mean, that's the reality of the internet today. And I think that what people want in the future is a solution that helps them navigate that so that it is a time saver, so that it is personalized or customized to their needs. So it's intuitive. So it learns our behavior and it starts to respond. Like if I pull out of my driveway, why do I have to hit the garage button for it to close? Why can't my car just sense that and close automatically? There's behaviors that are easily anticipated and the sensors mm -hmm. and the technology, it seems like it right should be there. there. <laughs> well, that's why you have the motion <laughs> sensor. The, the door will know that too. Yeah. It'll I, know I, all kinds of stuff. I sometimes feel like since the personal mobile revolution, I'm getting this much more done, a lot, but I'm actually spending this much more time to get there. Now, there's an efficiency there between those two, absolutely, but it's a net additional use of my resources. Uh, and I don't know if we accomplished something that we've been talking about a little bit here, which is, wait a minute, did we ever get the baseline of life to take less time and effort, or did we just make our lives more productive more efficiently? You know what I'm saying? We're, we're taking things out of our work worlds, and that's causing us to work more and to try to mm. work more efficiently. You know, you don't see um, people who work behind cash registers, or you're seeing fewer and fewer people who work behind cash registers, right? We, 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 it's a bifurcated world. You've got those who deal with data, which is a, a, where the opportunities are, and those who deal with physical objects. And if you, if you have to deal with a physical object in your job, there's a good chance you're not going to have a job in a few years. You know, we're just pulling, we're sucking all the, the smarts out of um, the day-to-day -day operations of retail stores, of anywhere we can to become more efficient. That, because we're pulling the data from one place to white collar workers, let's call them, whatever devices they mm -hmm. use, it requires us to process more information. So I think to your point, you know, there's a great book by Nate Silver, The Signal and the Noise, right? Yeah. We have to learn how to process what's signal and, and what's noise. And that's one of the skill sets that I think we'll acquire, we'll try to give to our kids as, we get old, as they get older, right? How to separate it. So you, you're not, because the challenge isn't that you have too much. The challenge, you just don't know which is the good stuff yeah, and which I, is the bad I stuff. I think one of the biggest advancements you're seeing is that, you know, almost everybody's now, uh, it used to be artificial intelligence and machine learning was just kind of a, something you'd find a few computer scientists <laughs> working on it, you know, computer science departments around the country. And, they, they were never bothered, and that's like they're the most highly demanded oh, yeah. people that you can APIs. hire. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. natural language, na machine language learning, and uh, machine learning, and you know, natural language parsing, and all of these yep. things that you I see, like Siri, that. that most people first you know, kind of recognized, or Google Now, and things of that nature. I mean, these are things where I think you know you're going to see it help fill the void and the gap. It's the interconnections of not just being functional on your device, because today you check your email, you check your calendar, you go into Yelp, 
you know, you go and, and you open up different application servers. It's, it's, it's really kind of, I think what you're seeing is that the platform providers are starting to make investments in those areas because they see that that is the future. They want people want to have sim seamless and ubiquitous context to what they do, not just necessarily being functional. So ultimately, is it personalization? Is that where, you know, that's where the innovation can be? I, that's where the I entrepreneurial... I think personalization is kind of, it's like convergence and all these other kind of <laughs> terms. It's like, I think it's, it's not just about personalizing things. It's, it's about giving them context. And I think in mobile, the great thing about your mobile device is it's got, you know, we call it mobile, local, and social, right? It's the intersection, the Venn diagram of those three things. It's that I'm mobile, and I know I'm at the Starbucks, and I know that my friend's there, and I help connect this together, and then also I give you a discount coupon because I know you're, you know, you're, um, uh, you're a longtime Starbucks customer, and I know what Starbucks coffee you drink every day because I, you know, seen you order that over and over again. It's like things like that, and that's probably a little far-fetched. I don't know if people want that level of personalization. Well, and how serious? But, we only have like three minutes left, so this is a big topic to jump into quickly. But how serious do security and privacy concerns become then, when when we're talking about exchanging so much data so seamlessly? I mean, we've already seen sort of troubles with seamless sharing. Uh, how how much more seriously do we have to start taking that? That's well, huge. I mean, you know, privacy, um, you know, because now you have this ubiquity of information, especially when you're talking about personalization and sharing information. I mean, look at all the, you know, things that are going on with Google and Facebook. I think that privacy becomes a big issue and everybody has to respect that. Uh, but security is, I think, this year most of the uh, people that you see who predict security threats, they say this will be probably the year that we're going to see one of the largest probably smartphone security threats, whether it's viral or malware. That we've started to see them in our industry. We track them uh, on, on a daily, weekly basis, but we're starting to see them progress more because smartphones have become so ubiquitous, and mm. we're trying to now educate people on protecting their phones with antivirus software and malware, uh, anti-malware software and safe browsing software because we're seeing some of the same threats that we saw in the early computer days now starting to, you know, uh, show themselves in the smartphone. Well, and then James says each new connected device become a possible vector. I mean, we all saw the story about the Samsung smart TVs being hacked. Maybe an entryway into your home network. Yeah, I think it's something we have to be aware of. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's an epidemic today. I think there's isolated cases. Um, I think all technology uh, makes that happen, right? They or the opportunity for that I to like happen. I like being the doom and gloom guy. Right? That was, that was <laughs> that's pretty smooth. Let's so see. let's just turn Wireless off 4G. Can't save and then, us. And then we don't have to worry about it. I didn't have my coffee today. So. Our phones are doomed. He's cranky. I think consumers, though, I think that, that this balancing act on, on safety and security is that if they can see a direct benefit, they, they are willing to sacrifice a little bit of privacy. But it has to be transparent. You have to be consistent about how you plan to use information, where it's going to go, where are the possibilities. Um, and I think that the more that conversation is had, the more prepared the marketplace is to understand when a misstep takes place. I'm not as worried about individual privacy and security because if I wanted to hack you, I'll just break into your mailbox or call your credit card company and pretend I'm your grandma, right? I mean, you can get through the individual stuff in the world we're in right now. I'm more concerned about the bigger hacks that impact our national security. I, I'm not as concerned about missiles as I am as, as somebody from overseas coming in and just messing with our whole, you know, communications infrastructure. Because, you know, you take out some cell phone towers in the right places, or you take out a network, you know, we got, we got problems. And so, to me, the, those are the bigger issues. The, the, the bigger have a big impact on society issues. Although Mark, talks about one, Mark talks about one of my favorite wild card scenarios that I ran across on a CIA website. So if someone were to detonate an atomic bomb into the atmosphere, it would shut down all satellite communication. You know, so you would, all of this connectivity that we rely upon that is so essential to our day to day, mm -hmm. health records, access to Medicaid, access to uh, financials, yeah. yep. all that's gone. It's, it's, yeah. TV show called Revolution about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and actually, it's funny because I was without power recently for, I don't know, 32 hours or some unbelievable you amount of time. Check your phone. And to be, no, I could check my phone. Oh, no, she went to the Starbucks plugged in. Yeah. I do, oh, yeah, yeah, I drove around in my car for like 30 minutes to charge my phones. Uh, no, but. But someone <laughs> tweeted me, if we were, if we were really going to talk about the connection, we probably should have talked about power. I mean, we start to, be, we start to have a very serious conversation about electricity yeah. being a, a, absolutely essential to powering, you know, obviously not just like lights and life and heat, but everything that we rely yeah. on so much. When any of this stuff goes down. This is a downer of a conversation. I know. Well, <laughs> don't think about this, people. Don't think about this. We're no. in no, Vegas. It's not gonna happen. Celebrate. That no. revolution thing didn't even make any sense. Yeah, but I hear don't. that show is available on demand now, so you can get all caught up over the top.
Don't go there. All right. The man for it because it was on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, uh, please help me and Molly thank our guests as we uh, wrap up this 10th anniversary Thanks, next big thing. Mark Cuban, James Fischler from LG, Cheryl Connolly, futurist at Ford, and Farid Adib of Sprint. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can just sort of hang out on.